Welcome to the SciChat Podcast. This week we will be discussing everything that has to do with U.S. aircraft armament. This is going to be the first of five-part series that I'll have over the next month or two, we'll call it, where we will dive into each country's munitions, guns, bombs, rockets, torpedoes, what ammo types, and some of the history that goes behind it. I would like to consider myself somewhat of an expert in the U.S. field. I've watched and studied this stuff for the past, call it 10, 15 years. So I feel pretty comfortable flying this one solo myself. I will find experts to bring in on those weeks so that we can get the most out of the experience for both of us. So first off, I'd like to lead off with the U.S. was pretty basic with what we had. We didn't use a wide range of munitions. And to start out with, I have, uh, I guess the easiest thing to start with was actually what's the gun that's in the Buffaloes and the Kingfishers, which is called the Browning 1919. Most of the U.S. machine guns were just retrofitted infantry or vehicle machine guns that were put on aircraft. So the Browning 1919 is a 30 caliber machine gun. You'll see it a lot in World War II movies or Band of Brothers where they carry it by hand. That's a Browning 1913, I'm sorry, Browning 1919 that fires 30 caliber rounds. And like I said, it's the little machine gun that's in the back in the front of the Kingfisher. There it is in the turret right there. The, probably the most common machine gun between World War II, uh, Korea, and I saw some service in Vietnam, and I believe it was kind of phased out after that. So the ammo types for it, pretty basic. You'll see it in the game, it's called 7.62, because that is the, you know, metric uh, caliber for it. You have Universal, which is a tracer, AP, I, so on. I won't get too much into that. Essentially... Typically, when you want to find ammo, it's armor-piercing incendiary tracers are typically the best for the U.S. You want to go for that gas tank ignition, which is the good thing about you know using a ton of machine gun bullets. So whenever you're trying to figure out what ammo to pick, you want to pick the one with the most names. So in this case, it would be... I, crap, universal. It's not very good for 30 cal, but... Anyway... And I'll put up a screenshot here of the different types of ammo, what they look like. Most of these are going to be 50 caliber pitchers. But when it goes to this, um, you want to pick the ones that have less tracers typically and more APIs in the name or high explosive. And we'll cover that down the road. And so that's the 30 caliber. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let's jump to the 50 caliber, which is the gun that's in the P-47. As you can see, the Hellcat right here. It's in almost everything. It was our most reliable thing. And I want to step back real quick in a little bit of history time. Uh, for those of you who have never heard the name John Browning or don't know much about him, it's really worth your time to just even just pull up a patent list of what this guy did uh, for the gun industry. Between, I mean, it's insane. Uh, the guns I can lift off that list off that he built was, the, like I said, the Browning 1919, the BAR, the 1911 Colt, um, the M2 machine gun, the uh, 37mm that's found in the King Cobras and Air Cobras was his design. This guy had his hands on so much stuff, so much stuff and I'm still discovering uh, random things that he had his hands in. Of course, the Browning High Power, which is a handgun that's used by the SAS, I believe, in, even until today's standards. So everything this man has still done is almost in service today. It's insane. The M2 machine gun, which... Well, as you saw, it was made for World War II. It's still in service in Afghanistan and Iraq today. So, um, one of the most brilliant gunsmiths, probably in the history of guns, at least in my opinion. And so, John Browning, the man. What a 50 caliber is, as you are somewhat familiar with, the Knight Springfield 1903s and the M1 Grands that the U.S. used, which fired a 30 6 round. So, when the U.S. came to him and said, "We need a bigger machine gun." He basically took the 30 6 which was our best caliber round, upsized it to a 50 cal. It's actually the same dimensions and everything, he just made it bigger. And then he built the gun around the bullet. And this thing is, as you heard, America 50 cal is, it's awesome. I, I can't stop preaching enough. And so, the only difference between the M2s that are in this wing is, essentially, you have what's called M2HB, which means heavy barrel. It has a quick detach barrel and it has the triggers on the back and it has a different feed mechanism, or not sorry, different feed mechanism, different charging mechanism for airplanes. Other than that, it's the same gun that you'll see on the top of Hummers today. This this gun has stand the test of time. I believe there's only been three variations of it for the most part for the infantry. 
and it just got its new overhaul just now just to get a quick detach barrel. This gun for the most part has stayed the same for was it 80, 90 years now? Incredible piece of work by John Browning. So let's get to the important part. The APITs and all that stuff. So you look at modifications, you have all these belts. What does that mean? Well typically the general rule is you want to get off default belt. Um, and when you see ball ammunition or practice ammunition, those are basically the same thing. There's no phosphorus or high explosive material in it. It's just a hot piece of lead flying into the air. And that's only going to do damage to what it hits. It doesn't have any kind of catastrophic you know, burning or uh, explosive properties behind it. So you kind of want to limit off the practice and ball ammunition as much as you can. Typically, I like to stick with the APIs, which are universal belts for planes. I always jump back and forth between. I've seen this debate back and forth, and I don't have the best answer for people, but I tend to stick with the universal belts, the API, the tracer, and the incendiary. Sometimes I experiment with the tracer API API I, which is the ground target belt, as you see. I don't, but I also feel like you can, you know, knock out that extra AP, AP and just fill it with the API. So, with the tracers for the Hellcat, as you see, it's a tracer API. I try to limit that because every other round is a tracer bolt, which does nothing to your target. Um, and the other problem with tracers, like we, in real life and in the game, I don't know how far tracers are off from where actual lead flies, but tracers typically actually don't go where you're shooting. It's just a guide. It's not a, you know, the tra if your tracers are hitting a plane, your bolts might be going a foot underneath it. They're not perfect. They weigh different and they fly different. And then you have stealth. If you're fucking awesome at this game and you can, you know, use the Jedi power of, you know, uh, Luke and can hit things without looking, then, you know, AP, API, incendiary, have at it, use stealth ammo. You're the man. If you look at the Mustang, which is a later variation of the ammos, it has a little bit difference with the tracers where it says APIT. And I typically use these because this will start fires left and right on planes especially German planes, will just ignite because they have the fuel tanks on the wing route. You know, good stuff right there. All right, now you see I'm using the API, APITI. That's what you want to aim for. Ground targets, I'm not too crazy about. It does work. I, I Basically, with the 50 caliber machine guns, you're going to go for, you know, spamming for the most part. You can do accurate shooting where you get fires, but for the most part, you want to put heavy bursts in the people because it's all about volume over quantity. Um, uh, last 50 caliber variation that you will see is actually in the Bearcat. The last 50 caliber variation you will see for John Browning's 50 caliber beauty is the M3 machine gun, which is in the Bearcat and in some of the later jets. All it is, it's a lightened version of the M2 machine gun, called the, you know, Ma Deuce. Gotta get that Ma Deuce in there sometime. The M3 is an upcycled machine gun, so the M2 will fire at 750 rounds a minute. The M3 is cycled up to 1,200 rounds a minute. They accomplished that by a feed mechanism and a different bolt. No, sorry, not a different bolt. A uh, boosted feed mechanism is what I'm trying to go for. So for the most part, same thing. You don't hardly see them around anymore on the earth. Um, I know a couple of people have them in the States where they actually fire them from the ground. They're, those are private collectors, but the M3 is pretty much a long gone piece of Americana history. And then let's jump to the 20 millimeter planes. Um, the Americans had a really bad time building a great 20 millimeter gun. For the Allies, they pretty much all relied on the Hispano uh, company's 20 millimeter design. The British took it and they did their Mark One through Mark Five, and then America tried to do their own version, and I believe Colt was the main backer behind that, and they had a lot of problems. The primary problem was that it had a light primer start strike, and for those who don't know much about guns, you have a primer in the back of a gun. When that primer gets struck by the hammer, it causes ignition and fires the gun. When you have a light primer strike, you have a dead round in the chamber, which means the next round can't come in, so the gun jams. So what you see is the Corsair 1C, is the first gun that got the ANM2 as the game calls it, but it's known as the M2 cannon, which was the first, it had failures left and right. The 1C ultimately wasn't used in mass production or even light. Um, the problem they also had with the 1C was that when like the left wing's guns failed and the right one still worked, they would fire it, the plane would yaw out of control because of the recoil, it was just bad. 
The only reason that this plane actually used the A&M-2 was because Lockheed Martin was very anal about everything they did and spent no cost. So the A&M-2 that's in this gun actually had an electric decocker and, or I guess, electric charging handle and a bunch of other stuff so that when the actual gun jammed, the pilot could hit the switch and it would pull back the bolt, clear it, and then load the next one in. That's pretty advanced stuff for a 1943 plane, 1942 plane. But the Lockheed Martin was the only one that found a way to use the A&M-2. The only other 20mm early plane you'll see is the P400, which was built for the Brits. That actually uses a Hispano, as the game says, Hispano 404. It's, it's like a Hispano Mark I from Britain. So those, the 20mm was shipped from Britain to the States to be built and then shipped back to the British. So that's the only reason that gun, that plane has an early uh, Hispano. And then we get to the A&M-3, which was more reliable, but still wasn't great, and that was put into typical stuff like the Panther right here. These are A&M-3s there are in the front, and then you have uh, stuff like the Bearcat 1B got them, the Sabre F2 got them. That was a test thing. No, that was, there wasn't very many Sabre F2s made. Um, i trying to think. There's some other random planes out there that have it. The other Panther... It's slipping my mind right now. The BTD, I believe, had A&M... Nope, A&M-2s around the BTD, too. So there you go, another plane of BT... A&M-2s. Um, and it slipped my freaking mind, and I'm going to remember later. The P6... I'm sorry, the Sky Raider was another plane that had the American uh, cannons in it. And then the P-61 also had... I believe they bought Hispanos for that one. So that's pretty much it for American 20 millimeters. The reason you don't see a lot of American cannons is because we just sucked at making them. Um, so that's pretty much all I like to say about bullets. If you guys have any additions, what you say like, oh, I use ground target ammo, I live, you know, I use tracer, I use universal. I like to hear why, because that's something after a year playing this game that I still experiment with. In one minute I like this, the next minute I hate this. So if you guys, you know, want to add anything to the rest of the newer players to, you know guide them on what ammo to pick because that's probably the most confusing thing about flying American planes is what 50 cal to use. Real quick I wanted to actually hold on we have the 37mm I forgot which is the other browning bullet. I will give one quick suggestion I have learned that when you use the 37mm you do not want to use universal because the APIT round sucks for hitting other aircraft this is the only gun I know of in the game that you actually want to use default for the HEFIT round, High Explosive Fragmentation and Serial Tracer Shell. Um, I've been getting much higher kill ratios, and uh, for those of you who fly King Cobras and Air Cobras, you get frustrated sometimes by hit registration. It's because 50% of the shells don't seem to do anything. Flip it to default, and you seem to be in pretty good business with that. So I thought I'd give that little tip out there. And then I also put up a picture of the M4 cannon, because I think it's a pretty cool device. Once again, hats off to John Browning. That'll be the last time I mention his name and this podcast. All right, so let's discuss fun stuff. Rockets. First rocket I'd like to point out is there's a lot of them called high-velocity aerial rockets, HVRs. And you'll see the game call like the 127mm, which is known as 5-inch in U.S., um, I believe the ones in game are rated to like 45 pounds of explosives. Uh, it's usually like TNT or composite B, composite B. Let's take a real quick. Oh, anyway, modifications. So let's see what the uh, P47 says. So the 114s are. Those are M10s. We'll get that in a minute. 10 127s are. So it doesn't say. So what I could find, they're basically 45-pound explosive charges. There's some out there that go up to 85 pounds. The game hasn't finished putting in, I think, the rest of the HVRs, and there's a ton of them. Um, the American HVRs were also used in bow fighters and some other random planes. Uh, the best way I can explain what they were used for, I, if you watch a lot of old documentaries, you'll see Hellcats using them all the time. That's not HVRs right there on my screen, so let's not get too crazy. These are the HVRs. And these were used in all kinds, but basically the Hellcats would fly over the islands during invasions in the Pacific Island and cover troops by just launching these into thick brush or enemy, you know, uh, enemy positions. Just kind of flush them out and cause chaos. 
I don't know how effective they really were, but it had to be quite terrifying to have rockets flying off airplanes at you plus the 50s. Good stuff. I know that in the Pacific, or sorry, the European theater that I've seen a lot of these things, P-47s use them, and the Typhoons, the Tiffies had them, and there's actually a cool story about the Tiffy, the Typhoons, I'll get to in a minute, but they used them for destroying factories, trains, you know, just, they used them as basically guided bombs was the idea. They weren't used as aerial, air-to-air -air rockets like the game liked to use them. Real quick story about the Typhoon, I don't know why I'm saying this now, but real quick, Typhoon Mark 1B, when they put the rockets onto them, they actually turn the gun sight sideways and use that as a target target finder uh, instead of, you know instead of using the 20 mils the shoot tanks they would just flip the sight sideways and then it's a perfect rocket guide anyway stupid fun facts the other American rocket you will see is the one that's on the A20 if I can find it where's my A20 it's under the Panther. A20 has these fun things. Nope, those are bombs. Hang on. Technical difficulties. The 114 meter, which is the da, 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 M10 bazookas, which, if you know the name of the bazooka, is the shoulder-fired rocket that we used all the time. It's typically a armor-piercing charge. I can get into that in more detail. But most of the armor-piercing shells, it was designed to hit basically small charge and it would blow in either hot copper or some type of explosive material through the armor to kill the crew inside and the bazooka was kind of a smaller rocket the Germans made better stuff and I don't know how I'd rate the Russians anti-tank rocket for this but this was an infantry fired shoulder fired rocket usually two men one would load and hook up the uh, it had a little wire that went on the back to fire it but they decided to put them on airplanes because America and so you see here is specifically Basically, three bazookas tied together, and then you fire them from an airplane. And I'll put up some pictures, as you see, of the shoulder-fired one and the one strapped to an airplane. Um, I can't find any real data on how successful these things were, but once again, I guess if you're flying low and you fire these, the psychological effect has to be worth it. And then the last one, the awesome one, the Tiny Thames, which were added in the patch a little while ago... Um, da, 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 the 298s. These are big, big rockets. Um, you can see them right there. I'll put a couple pictures up of them in real life. These things they used to let loose in the warehouses, ships, anything that was big. You want to go kaboom? We did it. So this was the age before air to air or air to ground missiles. You know, this is the first kind of guided ordnance we had that was just devastating. That about covers the rockets. Like I said, America has some more rockets that should hopefully eventually make it into War Thunder. We'll see. I don't know. Like I said, there should be a little bit more variety, but then again, I don't see too many players using rockets. But hey, when Ground Forces comes out, I can't wait to hit a freaking Tiger with some Tiny Thames. Keep that on the down low. And bombs. You'll see that there is a crap ton of bombs in this game, and American bombs are basically weights. We didn't have anything special. It was just mass-produced. A bomb is a bomb is a bomb by different weights. I will try to get more into bombs later on in a special one when we talk about bombers because that's more specific to then. Um, but, like I said, there's a guide on just basically light pillbox, 100 pounds, you know, heavy pillbox, 500 pounds, and so on. You can, if you're more accurate, of course, you can use a smaller bomb, but a bomb's a bomb. The last thing I'll mention is the Mark 13 torpedo, which was used for a very long time on every uh, plane that we had. And I don't actually see one exposed on any of our planes. Well, the Catalina will have them, so let's pull that up. You'll see Japan actually did a couple... Japan was big into switching through the torpedoes and trying to do advancements. Um... Here in America, we just made one torpedo at work, let it loose. And the Mark 13, as you can see, was the only one. There was a Mark 14, but it's actually not that different. Um, I guess I'll real quickly explain what you see with the wood on these torpedoes on the back and the front, um, especially with the back. When the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, this is in their Japanese design that we copied, so I'm giving all the credit to the 
great Japanese people who discovered this that sank our ships in Pearl Harbor. Won't go there. Um, the problem with torpedoes is that the Pearl Harbor was actually too shallow to use torpedoes. So they needed a way to let the torpedoes not basically slam into the bottom and have a chance at hitting their target. And so somebody came up with a very cheap idea of how do you drop torpedoes in shallow water? You put wood around the fin so that it only goes down, I think it was like 6 feet instead of the 15 feet it originally needed. So that when you see wood across the back of the fin there, it's to keep the torpedo from sinking all the way down the water and then coming back up. It just allows it to be dropped in shallow water. That's all it is. They didn't make the torpedo out of wood. I believe that wood part would actually break off when it hit the water. But it's just used to kind of create a splash. Um, let's see if the other one actually has it. Nope. There you go. So that one does not have the wood on it, so that would be a torpedo you typically drop in the ocean. So that's kind of the difference between a deep running torpedo and a shallow running torpedo. I wish they said something better in the description so you knew what you're actually picking. Yeah, there's nothing, there's no name in the title for either shallow or deep torpedo, and I don't really know if it does a lot in game. I'll have to do some torpedo experiments, I guess, at some point. So I hope that is kind of a lesson in U.S. aircraft armament. Um, I tried to run through this as quickly as possible for those of you who know all this. You know, I hope you picked up something maybe you didn't know. If you have any comments, questions, myself, and as you know, Kobe's a freaking gun nut. I'm a gun nut. Um, we'll try to answer them. And like I said, if you have any recommendations on what to use for 50 caliber ammo, because that's usually the big thing about U.S. is trying to decide if I should use APIT, AP, API. Uh, put down your comments, because I like to hear, like I said, I, I have different experiences with it, seems like, day to day. So, And then next week, I actually, we'll see what we have next week, actually. We'll say that. So, take care, have a great week, fly safe.